Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Kim, and I work with Dr. Lasasso and the team. I'm often the first person you speak to if you reach out uh, to our office. I help answer initial questions that you may have um, and help get you in touch with the right person uh, for your next steps. We do know that the Pectus journey is a challenging one, both physically and emotionally. Um, and we have a team of uh, dedicated, passionate, knowledgeable people that are here to help you throughout this process. Uh, they make sure that all your questions are answered um, and that you're comfortable moving forward with the next steps. And that's how these webinars came to be. We took your feedback um, and your questions that you sent into us and we turned these into um, them into monthly webinars uh, and host a Q&A at the end of each webinar. I will say the, our most um, popular topic and request that we get is on pain management. Um, so while we have done a pain management presentation before, um, this one is gonna be a little bit different. We're gonna do a deeper dive into those pain management techniques. And it, this will also be a 20 year perspective uh, presentation on those pain management techniques. So Dr. Lestasso will be starting with uh, where pain management started 20 years ago as the gold standard for the NUS procedure to the advancements that took us to where we are today. Um, it's very important um, if you are considering surgery that you understand these techniques um, and what's available because there isn't a standard way for every surgeon and every practice uh, to handle pain management. So it's very important to um, be familiarized with with these um, with these options and make sure that you're asking the right questions. Um, so we'll help you along with that process today. And as always, we'll have a live Q and A with Dr. Lasasso following the presentation. So feel free to type your questions into the chat box, and we'll get to them at the end. Or save your question, and we'll give you the opportunity to unmute and ask your question to Dr. Lasasso. Um, we will, of course, have the presentation saved to the web, to our website afterwards, uh, nestprocedure.com. And if you haven't already, make sure that you're signed up to hear about our future webinars. Um, we'll continue um, monthly webinar series um, as long as it's beneficial. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Dr. So. Dr. Lasasso, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Barry Lasasso. I'm coming to you today from my home in Edgewater, New Jersey. Uh, we've been doing these uh, webinars, as Kim stated, uh, on a monthly basis. It's been very gratifying to us that uh, the response has been so overwhelmingly positive. And uh, we want to uh, thank you all for your interest. And uh, we want to assure you that as long as there's an audience and uh, there are questions that you all have uh, that you want answered, we will be there to assist you and we will continue this webinar uh, into uh, 2021. Um, I want to thank all of you who uh, have uh, been uh, loyal followers of this webinar series, and uh, I hope you are all well and safe, either vaccinated or about to be vaccinated, and uh, I, I, I want to wish you all uh, um, a safe, uh, a safe uh, time here as we come out of this pandemic. So with that, I'd like to look at uh, the topic today, which is going to be the NUS procedure and advances in pain management, a 20 year perspective. Next slide. A little bit about myself for those of you who don't know me and maybe are joining me for the first time. Uh, I did my undergraduate work at Yale University and went to medical school at the University of Florida. I'm board certified in adult general surgery and pediatric surgery. I did my pediatric surgical fellowship at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City. Uh, following my fellowship, I went uh, 
to uh, California. Um, I had done my general surgery training at UCLA, so there were a lot of people that I had known over the years from California. I went to California and started my pediatric surgical career at the Rainy Children's Hospital, where I worked for 36 years. I was director of their chest wall deformities program and also uh, created an adult program for uh, the NUS procedure and pectus deformities at the adjacent adult hospital, Sharp Memorial Hospital. By way of my training in chest wall deformities, I trained directly with Dr. Donald Nuss. Uh, I spent um, uh, much time with him going back and forth between San Diego and Norfolk, Virginia, where he practiced. I learned the operation directly from him, and I created a program in San Diego that was uh, mirrored after his program. And I um, am eternally grateful for the mentorship and friendship that Dr. Nuss has provided me over the years. Next slide. My experience is that um, I've been doing the Nuss procedure for 20 years. Uh, Dr. Nuss presented his first work in 1998. I did my first Nuss procedure in 1999. So I've been doing it for 21 years. I've done over a thousand Nuss procedures and uh, I've done uh, procedures over a range of ages from 12 to uh, the oldest being 52. About 20% of the patients that I do are uh, adults as defined as over 21 years of age. In 2017, I had the opportunity to join uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Ranjadir Gandhi, in his private practice here in uh, New Jersey. Um, it was an offer that was generous and one I couldn't refuse. It was, it's been a joy working with Dr. Uh, Gandhi again um, after having been trained by him 35 years ago. And so it was, uh, a, it's been a joy being here in New Jersey. We work, uh, we do all of our uh, NUS uh, procedures at the Valley Hospital in Ridgewood, New Jersey where I operate on both uh, young adults and adults. This is the uh, entrance to the uh, Valley Hospital, which is part of the Valley Health System. Next slide. This is my team, all of whom I'm very, very proud of and also uh, indebted to. Uh, starting left to right, Allison Tan, who is my physician assistant. Often she'll be the first person that you uh, come in contact with. Uh, in the office, uh, often for those who reach out through the website, you'll come in contact with uh, Kim Fitzgerald, who uh, um, introduced me this evening, and she'll pass you along to Allison, who will do a lot of the initial teaching and uh, coordination of my schedule and yours so that we can get together and talk about your individual uh, pectus uh, uh, situation and strategize on how we're going to address uh, your uh, specific condition. In addition, within the office, doing scheduling and logistics are Georgia and Linda uh, Bliss. And also uh, we have Linda Banca who does our uh, insurance and billing uh, portion of the practice. She's a, a, a fantastic resource with regards to the uh, financing and, and, and the insurance issues that surround uh, doing the NUS procedure. Next slide. Tonight's talk is going to start with just a, a general overview of what Pectus is, what forms Pectus can take, and uh, also how a NUS procedure uh, is the definitive correction for uh, pectus excavatum. And then we're gonna go through that historical perspective of how we have treated uh, the pain and discomfort that comes with having a NUS procedure done, starting with thoracic epidural analgesia, which was the initial technique that Dr. Nuss uh, taught us all, and then uh, going forward with other uh, systems of pain management uh, that include the on-cue pain relief system, 
and then the more recent advances which involve different forms of intercostal nerve block using both a local anesthetic called Expirel and then most recently the use of cryoablation. We'll follow that with a uh, question and answer session. It's really important for you all to know that for those of us who have been doing this operation for over 20 years, the evolution of the NUS procedure and the evolution of modern post-surgical -surg pain management have, you know, sort of gone in parallel. So to tell the story historically of the NUS procedure and all the advances, we must talk about the advances that we have that this procedure has ushered in over its 20 year course with regards to managing surgical pain. Next slide. So chest wall deformities uh, are very common. Uh, pectus is a genetic condition. Uh, one inherits it. It can occur sporadically, but it's genetically driven and it involves the ribs in the front of the chest, which are made of cartilage, uh, similar to what gives the tip of your nose or your ears their shape. And that cartilaginous material is genetically different than the cartilage in other parts of your body. And that cartilaginous rib, genetically driven, grows abnormally, causing the ribs to buckle and creating one of three configurations, the most common of which is sunkenness, called pectus excavatum. The reverse of that, pigeon breastedness, sometimes referred to, pectus carinatum, where your chest protrudes, and then a very rare mixed version of those two, called pectus arcuatum, where the upper part of your chest protrudes and the lower part of your chest is sunken. It's very common, as I said, one in every 350 to 450 people on the planet will, will have some form of uh, pectus deformity. It, it's, it's common enough that on any beach anywhere in the country uh, during the summer, you can see someone with some form of this um, uh, deformity uh, if you look carefully. It affects men much more than women. There's four men to every woman with the condition. Um, and so it, 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 it does affect both genders, but men much more so than women. Next slide. It's important for you to understand the operation to correct uh, pectus excavatum. And it's important for you to understand that the NUS procedure is done to correct pectus excavatum or sunken chest. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Only pectus excavatum and how the NUS procedure corrects it. It's a minimally invasive surgical procedure. And by that, I mean it's through technology that uses telescopes and small instruments and very small incisions we are able to um, perform the correction of the deformity by placing an internal brace made of steel or titanium fashioned into the form of a bar that then is inserted into the chest, pushing the chest forward and correcting the deformity by allowing the bar to push the chest forward and over time, through a process of remodeling, a biologic process, the cartilaginous ribs, which were genetically growing abnormally, now suddenly reshape themselves under the force of the bar or bars, and the chest then reconfigures itself and becomes permanently reconfigured when the bars are left in long enough, which is generally three years at the very least. In a growing patient where the bars are placed in early in life, just at the time of puberty, often 
three years later, the patient is growing and therefore the bars need to stay in a little bit longer than just three years. But one can imagine that taking the chest from a sunken position to a corrected position is the result of a tremendous amount of force that translates into some pain and discomfort for the patient. So it was clear from the outset um, that, that the NUS procedure was somewhat miraculous in its correction of the deformity, but burdened the patient with pain that the surgeon and team need that was providing this care needed to address. And therefore, from the very first description of the NUS procedure, Dr. Nuss was very creative in coming up with a strategy to address that pain. Next slide, please. What's common to all strategies, regardless of where a NUS procedure is done, whether it's done on the East Coast or the West Coast, medication is necessary to control a patient's pain. And what has evolved over time is the cocktail of medications that we have arrived at uh, in um, collaboration with pain specialists uh, all over the country. Most of us doing this work at a very high level are doing it with the use of this multimodal analgesia drug strategy. Put very simply, it's a cocktail of medicines that work together to deal with the pain that the NUS procedure creates. Those pain medications include different classes of medicines. I'm gonna go through them very quickly, but I want you all to understand that it's drugs plus other techniques of delivering drugs specifically that reduce pain. And that's been the evolution of pain management uh, uh, during the course of uh, doing the NUS procedure over decades. The first medicine or class of medicine are opioids. We use those immediately during and after operations. We try to use as little as possible and limit their use for one week after surgery. That is the standard of care. We also use a class of drugs called anticonvulsants. Essentially, they were derived to control seizures. But what we've learned is that these medications, the most common of, of which is gabapentin, also turns down the volume of nerve impulses and therefore reduces pain in so doing. We use gabapentin before the surgery, usually a day, some people longer, but generally it's the day before surgery, the day of and daily for about two weeks after the patient is discharged from the hospital. In addition, we use muscle relaxants, the most common class of which is the benzodiazepines. That's Valium is one of the more common um, drugs in this family of medications. And they work in two ways. One, to decrease anxiety because the pain itself can create anxiety. Also the sense of pressure that people feel can create anxiety. And these medications help with that. In addition, they also relax the muscles. And it's not hard to imagine that not only is the skeleton being forced into a corrected position, but there's a tremendous amount of effect on the soft tissues of the chest and the back, in which, in which cause spasming of those large muscle groups that in and of itself uh, is painful. So directing medications to treating both the anxiety and the muscle spasm is critical in holistically trained, treating 
the pain that the NUS procedure creates. And last but not least, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, NSAIDs medications, the most common of which is ibuprofen, which is either, uh, uh, I'm sorry, which is either Motrin or Advil, are, um, are excellent medications for time after discharge. They're over-the-counter medications, but they work wonderfully. And we combine that often with intravenous NSAIDs, the most common of which is Ketorolac or Toradol during the hospital stay. And these medicines all in combination are um, critical to controlling the pain that the NUS procedure causes. Next slide. Now I'd like to talk about what we added on to this drug therapy that I just described, starting historically with what Dr. Nuss described, and that is thoracic epidural analgesia. That's a big fancy you know, collection of words, which simply means the placement of a small little catheter or two between the bones of the spine with the end of the tube coming to lie adjacent to the spinal cord. This allows the administration of medications into this space around the spinal cord called the epidural space. And it's these medications directed into that space that can, um, again, turn down the volume of pain that is being uh, transmitted to the brain through the peripheral nerves. And by short circuiting that neural transmission, you reduce the pain created by the bar or bars in the chest wall. Next slide. So this was the first pain management technique, which was described by Dr. Nuss in 1998. It was a significant improvement in the overall pain management scheme. It, it delivered the pain medicine right to an area where it effectively reduced the pain without causing other complications, which just treating that pain with, with opioids would cause diminished breathing, which could then lead to, you know, uh, problems of breathing shallow or not breathing at all, or breathing so shallow that the lung or lungs start to collapse. So those kind of lung complications and the GI complications of narcotics, such as nausea, vomiting, constipation, were eliminated through the use of epidural analgesia. Next slide. This is, this is the uh, diagram showing the technique of where the catheter is placed between the, the bones of the spine into the epidural space and through that uh, catheter, uh, medications are delivered. Next slide. This is an important slide for you to keep in mind because the nerves, the sensory nerves of the chest wall uh, serve band-like areas of the chest, and there are multiple levels of nerves, starting from the very top of the chest and going down to the level of the diaphragm. It'll be important for you to understand this because we direct, uh, in more recent times, medications and techniques that, that individually treat these intercostal nerves that then numb the chest wall. So the dermatomal distribution of pain is what is depicted on the right side of the slide. Next slide. The medications that are used are both local anesthetics like lidocaine or bupivacaine and pain medications, the most common of which are fentanyl and morphine, opioids. Next slide. 
like any medical technique, there are some disadvantages of the technique, which we've learned over time. And the most common of which uh, is that these small little tubes placed uh, in the back can often be displaced, which then causes a spotty or a, uh, a lack of good pain control coverage. And so patients, even though they've had good coverage for a period of time initially after placement of the catheter, would experience some decrease in that pain coverage uh, and begin to experience pain just because it was so easy for these small little tubes to be displaced. Less frequently, patients would have bleeding uh, complications as a result of the placement uh, of the catheters. Um, infrequent, but it did occur. Infections also occur, but very infrequently. But most infrequently, but most, most devastating in their effect, were in limited cases injuries directly to the spinal cord or to the covering over the cord would occur. And these were really the kinds of outcomes that made all of us doing this work think that there may be other ways of accomplishing what the epidural analgesia technique accomplished with the ability to minimize some of these more devastating and infrequent complications of an epidural catheter. Next slide. The next thing that evolved was a, a, a technique called on cue pain relief system. Next slide. This is a, a picture of the, uh, of the uh, um, equipment that delivers the pain medication in this fashion. Think of it almost like a garden hose with small little holes and leaks in the, in the garden hose that's inserted under the skin in the area where those small little incisions are made on either side of the chest wall. And using this equipment that in, involves a, a reservoir and a pump, uh, pain medication is delivered directly into the soft tissue around where the ends of the bar are located in the chest wall. A very, very effective way of delivering the pain medication to a generalized area, which then required the pain medication to then work its way down and to the nerves that supply those areas of the chest uh, where the medicine was directed. Next slide. It definitely reduced narcotic side effects because it was medication that was directed into the tissue itself. It was great because it could be used by the patient on demand, either as what we call a bolus, where a fixed amount is given over a short period of time, or continuously in smaller volumes. That's The same medications were used as in the epidural in that you could use both a local anesthetic and a narcotic or just a local anesthetic. Next slide. There were some potential complications and complications. Most of these were uh, of, uh, of very low frequency, but they involved um, the area where this small little tube was implanted and led to some collections of fluids, some infections and seromas that were associated with the volume of medication that was given and the patient's inability to absorb that fluid uh, as rapidly as necessary to avoid a collection of fluid, which would then cause either a collection of fluid under the skin or fluid that would collect and then drain through the, wound, through the wound, causing wound complications. In addition, it could cause inadequate pain relief. Uh, even though it was helping, it just didn't help enough. I do want to say that the on-cue 
uh, system is used by some providers uh, across the country, and um, and it, and it, it, it still has a role to play, uh, larger in some programs uh, than in others. So it is still a technique that is used by some. Now I'd like to talk about the things that are most recent advances in the um, uh, in the world of pain management uh, for the NUS procedure, and this is in that special group or, uh, of of techniques called intercostal nerve blocks. So remember, the intercostal nerves are the nerves that are under each of the ribs of the chest wall. Those nerves are both motor nerves and sensory nerves, but their most important role um, in the, in the post-operative NUS setting is that they are the main sensory nerves for the chest wall. So all the pain, um, signals that are going back to the brain of a patient with a nuss bar in their chest is coming from, the vast majority is coming through the intercostal nerves. So if you can block the intercostal nerves without actually having to put medicine in and around the spinal cord, then all the better, all the more safe and equally effective. So that's how this whole world of intercostal nerve block has evolved. The first technique I'd like to uh, talk to you about is a technique that I have changed, that I have used in my practice. And it's the use of a local anesthetic called bupivacaine that has been re-engineered and and, uh, and in so doing, it has uh, allowed this local anesthetic to have its effect prolonged significantly. So bupivacaine will last when used in its standard configuration about two to four hours. But in the form that it is when it is expirel, it has been mated or attached to this liposome, this thing called the liposome. Think of it almost like a little water balloon of pain medicine that has a very slow leak in it. And slowly over time, the liposome releases the local pain medication and works to turn off the signal of the intercostal nerve back to the brain. So it essentially, pharmacologically, through the action of the medicine, disconnects the nerve from the brain and causes numbness of the chest wall in so doing. Next slide. So the pros, so the reason why this is such an effective technique of pain management is that it prolongs the effect of local anesthesia up to three to four days. And the technique is very straight and, and, and uh, very uh, safe and straightforward. It is, it, it is a technique that um, is facilitated by having a telescope called a thoracoscope in the chest, which is part of the equipment that we use to do the NUS procedure safely. And using that telescope and the skill of the surgeon, a small needle can be directed right to where the intercostal nerve lives under the rib. And a portion of this medication can, under direct vision, be injected around the nerve very precisely that then short circuits that nerve for up to three to four days. I, I do this over about eight levels 
over in each chest cavity. So it's it's eight injections on one side, eight injections on another. And once you get good at this, it takes you about 10 minutes to do. It, it reduces the need for post-operative opioids, narcotics, not to zero, but it definitely reduces the amount of narcotic necessary. It, 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 it eliminates injuring the nerve. You're not injuring the nerve in any way, okay? You're just pharmacologically turning the nerve off. And it accomplishes exactly what we would hope it would do. It reduces the hospital stay up to one to two days of what it would have been if you would have just used the old technique of thoracic epidural. Next slide. The cons are simply that the effect lasts only as long as you're in the hospital, about three to four days. So in most cases, it's necessary to continue the multimodal therapy beyond the hospital stay, which is pretty much what almost all techniques require. And in my practice and in my experience, the use of narcotics, once one goes home, and once this nerve block has diminished, is accomplished with all the medicines we talked about, plus a narcotic, simple narcotic like Percocet, which is oxycodone and Tylenol, taken a few times a day for no longer than a week. And then the patient is able to be managed on just Tylenol, NSAIDs, which is Motrin or, or Advil, and some Valium. And that usually is necessary for about two weeks post-op. There are some technical errors that can occur that would lead to an inadequate pain relief, meaning if you don't put the medicine where the nerve lives, then the effectiveness of the injection will be diminished. Also, if you put the needle um, not next to the nerve, but into one of the blood vessels around the nerve and don't, and don't recognize that, then that could be a problem. But again, very unlikely that intravascular injection would occur in the hands of someone who is skilled and knowledgeable in doing this technique. Next slide. So now I'd like to talk about this newest and latest advance, which is sort of taking the concept of intercostal nerve block and using an instrument to freeze the nerve, which now injures the nerve in a controlled fashion and completely disrupts the function of the nerve in terms of transmitting pain signals to the brain for a protracted period of time. That's the difference between pharmacologic expiral intercostal block and cryoablation. Let me now explain how cryoablation works. And I want to thank Articure, the company that makes the um, cryo probe for the information that they have provided me and that I wish to share with you tonight. Next slide. So on the left are the probes. Basically, it's a, an instrument that, that in a very precise fashion for a very specific length of time freezes the nerve and it's inserted through the chest wall using the telescope or thoracoscope allows the surgeon to direct the cold treatment in a very small area directly onto the nerve. So again, the anatomy is important to understand. 
It's the same nerve that one blocks with x -ray. okay? It's the sensory and motor nerve called the intercostal nerve. It runs under the lower edge of the rib. It's easily seen. And the cold that's applied injures the internal aspect of the nerve. So the sheet or outer covering remains intact. It's the axon. It's the actual nerve tissue inside the sheet that is injured. It's almost like the cold cuts the nerve. The good news is that the body being the amazing machine that it is allows for this peripheral nerve over time at about a rate of one to two millimeters a day regenerate itself. But for a protracted period of time, for the time that the, that the patient is in the hospital and beyond, the nerves of the chest wall have been disrupted and the chest wall is numb. So you can imagine that the amount of pain relief from that technique is, is protracted and significant, okay? And reduces the amount of pain medicine and duration of pain treatment significantly, okay? Next slide. The way that the, the probe creates the extreme cold is through gas being directed across a valve. And the physics of that creates extreme cold. The cold directed to the nerve directly disrupts. Think of it almost like cutting the nerve internally, okay? And that's done through the use of a sterile, single-use instrument called a cryoprobe. It blocks the electrical connection and conduction of pain down the nerve to the brain. The pros of that technique, of the technique, is it's done under direct vision. It reduces hospital stay, and it reduces the use of pain medications in general, but specifically narcotics. And it almost, almost eliminates the need for narcotics um, uh, in the post-discharge phase of a patient's recovery. Next slide. This is the, I call it the pectus cryozone. It's the area of the chest wall. Remember those bands of sensation that I showed you earlier in the talk. It's that area and the nerves that correspond to those areas that need to be frozen and disrupted in order for the, um, for the technique to be effective. And, and so it's, it's about from the thoracic level three to the thoracic level nine, where the, um, where the nerves to the chest wall are located. And in general, um, the cryoablation technique is applied to a smaller number of nerves than T3 to T9, just for the sake of safety. Next slide. I'd like to share with you uh, one of Articure's um, uh, patient education uh, videos. It's done in sort of cartoon form, but it's a really great um, and, and I think easy to understand explanation of the history of cryotherapy and how the cryoablation technique specifically uh, can be very effective in dealing with uh, the pain following a nest procedure. 
So I'm going to take a minute and play this for you. Ever heard of cryotherapy? It means using cold temperatures to reduce the pain signals sent to the brain. Sound familiar? It's been around for a long time. Way back in the day, the ancient Egyptians had a cool walk, and they understood that applying cold to injuries helped reduce pain. Next stop, ancient Greece. A dude named Hippocrates had snow brought down from the mountains to use as pain relief for soldiers' wounds. Even Napoleon's surgeons used ice to treat pain for soldiers returning from battle. Fast forward to today. Combining this idea with modern-day medical technology, doctors can freeze specific nerves at just the right place to reduce pain after surgery. It's called cryo nerve block, and it's a popular way to manage pain. Cryo nerve block involves freezing the intercostal nerves located in your chest underneath each rib. These nerves are the primary source of pain after chest surgery, and cryo nerve block helps by temporarily shutting off this nerve. With cryo nerve block, you'll have a sensation of numbness after surgery, which means a lot less pain. So, how does cryo nerve block work? Your nerve has two main parts: an outer protective structure and the actual nerve that transmits the pain to your brain. By freezing the nerve at a specific temperature, the nerve is disabled without damaging the protective structure. This allows the nerve to regrow right back where it was before. Another way to think of this is to imagine a garden hose. The hose is the protective structure of the nerve, and the water is your nerve. When your surgeon freezes your nerve, it's like turning off the water. It temporarily shuts off the flow of pain for that specific nerve. Over several months, your nerve gradually regrows, about one to two millimeters per day, or about the thickness of a credit card. As they regrow, the numbness slowly goes away. Cryo nerve block is one part of managing pain after surgery. Your surgeon may also use injections during surgery to manage pain, and your nurses may give you pills as you recover and leave the hospital. That's cryo nerve block. For more information on this procedure, talk with your surgeon or healthcare provider. Next slide. I'd like to thank Atricure once again for Familiar? providing this. It's been around for a long. This educational um, uh, material, uh, I, I think it's very helpful uh, to uh, share that with all of you. Next slide, please. Next slide. This is a, a diagram showing how the probe is inserted uh, into the chest and how through the thoracoscope one sees the probe very clearly uh, and where the edge of the uh, rib is and where the nerve is located very clearly so that the uh, probe can be very precisely applied to the nerve uh, and very, very safely, safely uh, applied. Next slide. I think the complications or cons, I won't call them complications, though some of them are, but the, but the, the downside of cryoablation uh, is, is something that uh, I want to share with you. Uh, I also want, as a, as a disclaimer, to uh, let you all know that I have not used cryoablation in my practice. However, I am anxious to learn more about cryoablation and will be in the near future um, spending time uh, with providers who do use this technique to learn more about it. So the cons that I'm sharing with you are, are not cons that I have personally experienced, but are rather um, issues that have been raised in the uh, medical literature that pertains to this technique. 
uh, that I wish to share. I think it's important for anyone who is considering having this technique used in the course of their operation, talk specifically to their provider regarding in that individual's hands uh, what, um, what downsides or negative issues have occurred in the course of their practice when using this instrument. But in general then, based on the literature, there is an increased operative time, not excessive, but time necessary to block all the nerves using the probe, uh, requiring periods in which the probe has to warm before it again is used to cool. So there's a, uh, an implicit amount of time for each application of the instrument that involves a finite but specific amount of time given the number of levels that you're going to be treat, uh, treating. In addition, care has to be taken that the probe only is applied to the area where the nerve is located and care is taken to avoid um, the probe, super cooled as it is, touching any other structures, namely the heart or the lung. In skilled hands, this can be accomplished. When the lung is touched, it can lead to an injury that in a delayed fashion causes the lung to leak air. Anyone using this technique knows of this complication, does everything they can to avoid it, and is very, very uh, vigilant regarding the monitoring of the patient uh, such that if it does occur, it's recognized and treated appropriately. The probe can also cause um, a, uh, 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 a cooling injury, a, a thermal injury to the soft tissue of the chest wall. There are steps that providers use to avoid that complication. I think the most important thing for uh, patients to be aware of is that unlike Expiril, which is very time limited, okay, this technique of intercostal block um, um, persists for a protracted period of time. And what's interesting is that it, this effect, the effect on the nerve, both in terms of the recovery of the nerve and in terms of any um, uh, complications of, 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 of uh, neural transmission from the nerve seems to be um, dependent on the age of the patient. Put very simply, that we, we know that when nerves are injured, there can be pain associated with nerve injury during the time the nerve is recovering. That's called neuropathic pain. It's different than numbness. It's not numbness. It's actually unpleasant sensations that can include burning and tingling and sort of an electric sensation. That can occur as the nerve recovers as a result of the nerve being injured, in this case, frozen, okay? And that seems to occur more in patients over the age of 21 during their nerve recovery than it does in younger patients, meaning under the age of 21. And in addition, there can be a very period of time in which the numbness resolves. Again, in younger patients, in growing patients, it's not hard to imagine that an injured nerve will grow more rapidly and more completely to reestablish full sensation in the chest wall. Less so in the adult patient. 
So in the adult patient considering cryoablation, I think you need to consider the fact that there may be some unpleasant sensations that you have during the recovery from the, from the uh, nerve block and that there may be a prolonged period of time in which your chest wall is numb. Maybe not completely, but in areas of the chest wall. And so that's part of the calculation that each individual patient and their family need to think through with the provider um, before committing to this technique of pain management. Next slide. I think I can summarize the talk by saying there is a new gold standard for pain management. And it includes multimodal analgesia that we taught, that cocktail of medications, combined with intercostal nerve block, of which there are two types, either Expiril, which is a pharmacologic nerve block, a drug-induced nerve block, or cryoablation, where the nerve is actually frozen. Both Expiril and cryoablation decrease length of stay and decrease the use of narcotics, both of which is a tremendous leap forward in addressing the um, inevitable discomfort that patients feel as a result of having a NUS procedure. I wanna thank you all very much for your attention uh, and, uh, and your participation in tonight's webinar.